Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Chronicles of Narnia. Silent God of War 20 story time. We're now up to the Magician's Nephew, chapter 10. The first joke and other matters. It was, of course, the lion's voice. The children had long felt sure that he would speak. Yet it was a lovely and terrible shock when he did. One of the trees, wild people, stepped forth. Gods and goddesses of the wood, with them, came fawns and satyrs and dwarfs. Out of the river rose the river god, with his naiad daughters, and all these, and all these beasts and birds in their different voices, Low or high or thick or clear, replied, Hail, Aslan! We hear and obey. We are awake. We love. We think. We speak. We know. But please, we don't know much. But please, we don't know very much yet, said a nosy and snorty kind of voice. At that, And that really did make the children jump, for it was the... Sorry. But please, we don't know very much yet, said a nosy and snorty kind of voice. And that really did make the children jump, for it was the cab horse who had spoken. Good old strawberry, said Polly. I am glad he was one of the ones picked out to be a talking beast. And the cabbie was now standing, and the cabbie who was now standing beside the children said, Strike me pink, I always did say that, oh, that os, uh, had a lot of, had a lot of sense though. Creatures, I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give you forever this land of Narnia. I give you the woods, the fruits, the rivers. I give you the stars. I give you myself. The dumb beasts whom I have not chosen as yours also, uh, are yours also. Treat them gently and cherish them, but do not go back to their ways, lest you cease to be talking beasts. For out of them you were taken, and into them you shall return. You can, you can return. Do not do so. <clears throat> no, Aslan, we won't, we won't, said everyone. But one perky jackdaw added in a loud voice, No fear! And everyone else had finished just before he said it so that his words came out quite clear in a dead silence. And perhaps you have found out how awful that can be. Say at a party, the jackdaw became so embarrassed that it hid its head under its wings as if it, had been, as if it was going to sleep. And all the other animals began making various queer noises, which are their ways of laughing and which, of course, no one has ever heard in our world. They tried at first to repress it, but Aslan said, Laugh and fear not, creatures. Now that you are no longer dumb and witless, you need not always be grave, for jokes as well as justice come in with speech. So they all let themselves go, and there was such merriment that the jackdaw himself plucked up courage again and perched on the cab horse's head between his ears, clapping its wings and said, Aslan, Aslan, have I made the first joke? Will everybody always be told how I made the first joke? No, little friend, said the lion. You have not made the first joke. 
You have only been the first. You have you you have only been the first joke. Then everyone laughed more than ever, but the jackdaw didn't mind and laughed just as loud. Till the horse shook his head, and the jackdaw lost its balance and fell off, but remembered its wings. They were still new to it. Before it reached the ground. And now, said Aslan, Narnia is established. We must next take thought for keeping it safe. I will call some of you to my council. Come thither, come hither to me, you the chief dwarf, and you the river god, and you the oak and he owl, and both the ravens and the bull elephant. We must talk together, for though the world is not five hours old, an evil has already entered it. The creatures he had named came forward, and he turned away eastward with them. The others all began talking, saying things like, What did he say had entered it? An evil? What's a evil? No, he didn't say a evil. He said a weevil. Well, what's that? Look here, said Diggory to Polly. I've got to go after him. Aslan, I mean, the lion. I must speak to him. Do you think we can? Said Polly. I wouldn't dare. I've got to, said Diggory. It's about Mother. If anyone can give me something that would do her good, it would be him. I'll come along with you. I said, I'll come along with you, said the cabby. I like the looks of him. And I don't reckon these other beasts will go for us. And I want a word with old Strawberry. So all three of them stepped out boldly or as boldly as they could, towards the assembly of the animals, of animals. The creatures were so busy talking to one another and making friends, that they didn't notice the three humans until they were very close. Nor did they hear Uncle Andrew, who was standing, trembling in his button boots, a good way off, and shouting, but by no means at the top of his voice. Diggory, come back! Come back up once when you're told. I forbid you to go a step further. When at last they were right in among the animals, the animals all stopped talking and stared at them. Well, said the he beaver at last, what in the name of Aslan are these? Please, began Diggory, in rather a, breath a breathless voice, when a rabbit said, They're a kind of large letters, that's my belief. No, we're not. Honestly, we're not, said Polly hastily. We're not all nice to eat. There, said the mole. They can talk. Whoever heard of a talking lettuce? Perhaps they have the second joke, suggested the, the jackdaw. A panther, which had been wishing, uh, washing his face, stopped for a moment to say, Well, if they are... They're nothing like, they're, they're nothing like so good as the first one. At least I don't see anything very funny about them, he yawned, and went on with his wash. Oh, please, said Diggory. I'm in such a hurry. I want to see the lion. All this time the cabbie had been trying to catch Strawberry's eye. Now he did. Now, Strawberry, old boy, he said. You know me. You ain't going to stand there and say, and say, and say as you don't know me. What's the thing talking about, horse? Said several voices. Well, said Strawberry very slowly. I don't exactly know. I think most of us don't know much about anything yet. But I have a sort of idea I've been... A thing like this before. I've a feeling I lived somewhere else, or was something else. 
before Aslan woke us all up a few minutes ago. But it's all very muddled, like a dream. But there were things like these three in the dream. What? said the cabby. Not know me. Me what used to bring you... <laughs> me what used to bring you a hot mash of an evening. When you were... When you was out of sorts. Me what rubbed you down proper. Me what never forgot to put your cloth on you. If you were standing uh, in the cold. If you were standing in the cold. I wouldn't have thought of it. I wouldn't have thought it of you, Strawberry. It does begin to come back, said the horse thoughtfully. Yes. Let me think now. Let me think. Yes, you used to you used to tie a horrid black thing behind me and and then hit me to make me run, and however far I ran, this black thing would always be coming rattle rattle behind me. We had our living to earn, see, said the cabby. Yours the same as mine, and if there hadn't been no work or and no whip, There'd have been no stable, no hay, no mash, no, and no oats. For you did get a taste of oats, when I could afford them, when no one, <laughs> which no one can deny. Oats, said the horse, pricking up his ears. Yes, I remember something about that. Yes, I remember more and more. You were always sitting up somewhere behind, and I was always running in front, pulling you and the black thing. I know I did all the work. Summer, I grant you, said the cabby. Hot work for you and a cool sea for me. But what about winter, old boy, when you was keeping yourself warm, and I was sitting up there with, with my feet like ice, and my nose fair pinched off me with the wind? And my hands that numb, I couldn't hardly hold the reins. It was hard, cruel country, said Strawberry. It was a hard, cruel country, said Strawberry. There was no grass, all hard stones. Too true, mate, too true, said the cabby. And our world it was. I always did say those paving stones weren't fair on my oss. That's, that's London, that is. I didn't like it no much more than you did. You were a, you were a country oss, and my, and I was a country man. Used to sing in a choir, I did, down at down at home. But there wasn't a living for me there. Oh, please, please," said Diggory. "Could we get on?" The lion's getting further and further away, and I do want to speak to him so dreadfully badly. Look here, Strawberry, said the cabby. This young gentleman has something on his mind that he wants to talk to the lion about. Him you call Aslan. Suppose you was to let him ride on your back. Which he'd take, which he'd take it very kindly, and trot him over there to, to where and trot him over to where the lion is, and me and the little girl will be following along. Ride, said Strawberry. Oh, I remember now. That means sitting on my back. I remember there used to be a little one of you, two leggers. You used to do that long ago. He used to have a little hard square, have little hard square lumps of some white stuff that he that he gave me. They tasted oh wonderful, sweeter than grass. Ah, that'd be sugar," said the cabby. "Please, strawberry," begged Diggory. "Do, do let me up and take me to Aslan." "Well, I don't mind," said the horse. Not for once in a way. Up you get. Good old strawberry, said the cabby. 
Here, young'un, I'll give you a lift. Diggory was soon on Strawberry's back, and quite comfortable, for he had ridden bareback before, on his own pony. Now do gee up, Strawberry, he said. You don't happen to have a bit of that white stuff about you, I suppose, said the horse. No, I'm afraid I haven't, said Diggory. Well, it can't be helped, said Strawberry. And off they went. At that moment, a large bulldog, who had been sniffing and staring very hard, said, Look! Isn't there another of these queer creatures over there, beside the river, under the trees? Then all the animals looked and saw Uncle Andrew standing very still among the rhododendrons, and hoping he wouldn't be noticed. Come on, said several voices, let's go and find out. So while Strawberry was briskly trotting away with Diggory in one direction, and Polly and the cabby were following on foot, most of the creatures rushed towards Uncle Andrew with roars, barks, grunts, and various noises of cheerful interest. We must now go back a bit and explain what the whole scene had looked like from Uncle Andrew's point of view. It had not made all the same impression on him as on the cabby and the children. For what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you're standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. Ever since the animals had first appeared, Uncle Andrew had been shrinking further and further back into the thicket. He watched them very hard, of course, but he wasn't really interested in seeing what they were doing, only in seeing whether they were going to make a rush at him. Like the witch, he was dreadfully practical. He didn't simply... Now he simply didn't notice that Aslan was choosing one pair out of every kind of beast. All he saw, or he thought he saw, was a lot of dangerous wild animals walking vaguely about, and he kept on wondering why the other animals didn't run away with the big lion. When the great moment came and the beast spoke, he missed the whole point. For a rather interesting reason. When the lion had first begun singing long ago, when it was still quite dark, he had realised that the noise was a song, and he had disliked the song very much. It made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. Then, when the sun rose, he saw that the singer was a lion only a lion, as he said to himself, he tried, he tried his hardest to make believe that it wasn't singing, and never had been singing, only roaring as any lion might in a zoo in our own world. Of course it can't really have been singing, he thought. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? And the longer and more beautifully the lion sang, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Now the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you are very often you very often succeed. Uncle Andrew did. He soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song. Soon he couldn't have heard anything else, even if he'd wanted to. And when at last the lion spoke and said, Nanya, awake! He didn't hear any words. He only heard, he heard only a snarl. And when the beast spoke in answer, he heard only barkings, growlings, baying and howlings. And when they laughed, well, you can imagine, that was worse for Uncle Andrew than anything that had happened yet. 
such a horrid, bloodthirsty din of hungry and angry brutes he had never heard in his life. Then, to his utter rage and horror, he saw that the other three humans actually, he saw the other three humans actually walking out into the open to meet the animals. The fools, he said to himself. Now those brutes will eat their rings along with the children. And I'll never be able to get home again. What a selfish little boy that Diggory is. And the others are just as bad. If they want to throw away their own lives, that's their business. But what about me? They don't seem to think of that. No one thinks of me. Finally, when a whole crowd of animals came rushing towards him, he turned and ran for his life. And now anyone could see that the air of that young world was really doing to the old gentleman. It was really doing the old gentleman good. In London, he had been far too old to run. Now he ran at a speed, at a speed, which would have made him certain to win the hundred yards race at any prep school in England. His coattails flying out behind him were a fin were a fine sight, but of course it was no use. Many of the animals behind him were swift ones. It was the first run they had ever taken in their lives, and they were all longing to use their new muscles. After him! After him! They shouted. Perhaps he's back evil. Tally ho! Tantavy! Got him off, round him up! Keep it up, hooray! In a very few minutes, some of them got ahead of him. They lined up in a row and barred his way. Others hemmed him in front, behind, in from behind. Wherever he looked, he saw terrors. Antlers of great elks, and the huge face of an elephant towered over him. Heavy, serious-minded bears and boars grunted behind him. Cool-looking leopards and panthers with sarcastic faces, as he thought, stared at him and waved their tails. What struck him most of all was the number of open mouths. The animals have really opened their mouths to pan. He thought they had opened their mouths to eat him. Uncle Andrew stood trembling and swaying, this way and that. He had never liked animals at the best of times, being usually rather afraid of them. And of course, years of doing cruel experiments on animals have made them hate and fear him far more. Now, sir, said the bulldog in his business-like way. Are you animal, vegetable or mineral? That was what it really said. But all Uncle Andrew heard was a... And that was chapter 10 of The Magician's Nephew. Next episode, chapter 11. Diggory and his uncle are both in trouble. Until then. Grrr.